Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Skywatcher What's Up webcast, where we take a look at everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks, where we take a from for visual and imaging. And of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. Um, today, we are actually going to be talking about prepping for an eclipse. Um, I will let you know that there is some material inside of this presentation that was also part of capturing an eclipse from a couple weeks ago, um, particularly when we start talking about equipment. So I'm just giving you guys a heads up on that. I will also let you know that if you are coming to Seoul tomorrow, this presentation is also what I will be giving um, there as well. Um, same thing, but uh, just letting you guys know. And speaking of that, uh, I know some of you are actually on your way here to Phoenix to join us for Seoul. Uh, the Solar Observing Lab that we've been talking about for several weeks now is finally here. It's tomorrow. The weather is going to be good. Um, we have all kinds of equipment uh, from solar eclipse glasses to an 8-inch hydrogen alpha system um, and everything in between. If you ever want to know what white light, calcium, hydrogen alpha, double stack hydrogen alpha, anything you could ever possibly want to know about the sun, you can learn about it tomorrow at Seoul. It's $10 to get in. All the proceeds from the tickets go right to the uh, Earth and Space uh, Expedition Center, which is the venue holding this. Um, it is from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., and then you can come back at 6.30 and join us for a star party um, till 9.30, uh, where we'll have my 28-inch telescope will be out there. Star Zone will be doing hyperstar demos. Uh, all kinds of awesome stuff. It's been a long time in the works. I know some of you that generally watch this will be there. I look forward to meeting you. I will be running around all over the place, but I look forward to seeing you guys there. Um, and yeah, so that's Seoul. Um, we have all kinds of stuff that you can enter to win a Star Adventure 2i. There's a silent auction. All kinds of cool stuff is happening tomorrow. So that is uh, this weekend. Um, if you need some cool swag for your Skywatcher stuff, you can go over to skywatcher.threadless.com and pick up some cool shirts. There's all kinds of fun goodies sitting up there right now. Go ahead and check that out. Now, we are not far from the holidays. We have a fair amount of inventory, too. So if you're looking for stuff, we have EvoStar refractors. EvoLux refractors are in stock. Um, Star Adventure 2Is, EQ6RI. Um, all kinds of stuff so i would if you've got something in mind there's stuff floating around now so um yeah now's the time to get it and i would not recommend waiting if you're looking for something for the holidays stuff is going to go very quickly especially the closer that we get so if you know there's something that you're looking for you or somebody else uh, for the holiday season now is the time to really can seriously consider picking it up and just stowing it away until you know the holidays that way you are ahead of the curve because it is going to go quickly for a lot of the equipment there um, but anyway uh, we talked about that last week and yeah all right so let's get started um, now we are just under a year away October 14th is the annular solar eclipse that is going through uh, North America and then following in April of 2024, we have the total solar eclipse. So now is a big, big time for solar astronomy. And to prepare for that, you really need to think about things in advance. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we get started, if you like what you see here at the What's Up webcast, please go ahead and hit subscribe. Um, if you have an idea for an episode, email us at info at skywatcherusa.com and title it What's Up. So let's get started. Prepping for an eclipse. Now, I got to see the 2017 total solar eclipse, and I've seen a couple other solar eclipses as well, but 2017 was the first like major eclipse that I traveled for, and that trip took years of planning to make happen, and there were a lot of changes along the way. But knowing what I've done through that, and I'm sure many of you have also done this if you saw the 2017 eclipse, um, it takes some thought to actually go through and prep for something like this. And now is the time where you need to get very serious about planning for that, especially 2024. Um, it sounds like it's a long way away. I know a lot of people are like, well, that's in 2024. It will be here faster than you know it. If you want to see this eclipse, you need to make sure you know what you're doing. 
you know where you're going and you have the equipment that you're going to need ready as well and if you don't own that equipment it is not a wait till the last minute kind of thing you need to be prepared even if it's something as simple as an eclipse glasses or something as big as a very fancy filter um, now a year away is when you need to be thinking about that especially because of all the stuff that's happened with covid you know it takes a few months sometimes to get your equipment so you want to make sure at least you've started that ball rolling if you have not already so let's break it down here's the things that we need to consider before for prepping for an eclipse number one what kind of eclipse are we prepping for is it a total eclipse is it an annular eclipse is it a partial eclipse what is it um, some are going to be easier than others to plan for location where are you going um, do you have an idea of where you're going do, are you going to need a place to stay do you have friends or relatives that you could stay with are you going to have to get a hotel um, can you get a hotel you know are the, are the prices jacked up you know that's something you have to consider and then of course our favorite one that we all like to talk about because we're astronomers and gear junkies is equipment what do you need to view it safely we are observing the sun you have to do this carefully you have to make sure you know what you're doing in order to not damage your eyes um, and be able to do what you want to do do you own that equipment do you need to get a new filter is there a type of filter that you want to use you know for it? what are what are all the different aspects that we have to consider when talking about equipment um, but all of these things have to come into play in order for when that day comes, you're ready to go. Um, there's a lot of pieces that have to fall into place. So let's start out with eclipse type. So there are three major types of solar eclipses, partial, annular, and total. Um, 2023 in October is an annular eclipse. And then if you're on the path, you will see the ring of fire, which is what you see there, the annular. Um, for the rest of the country, it's going to be partial. Uh, so that's 2023. And then in 2024, you have the total solar eclipse in April. And you have to be on the path of totality to see totality. Anything beyond that, you are having a deep partial eclipse. So there's different ways that we have to approach this from location and equipment and stuff like that. So you're going to want to understand what kind of eclipse you're viewing. So location isn't going to be as big of a deal if, you know, depending on what it is. If it's an annular eclipse or a total eclipse, there is an eclipse path that you need to be inside of if you're going to see the annular or the ring of fire which is right here or totality for a total eclipse you have to be along the eclipse path to be able to see that phenomenon now that's where location is going to be a big deal now an annular eclipse isn't as big of a deal to the public it's a huge deal but it's not as big as a total eclipse because an annular eclipse you have to use you have to use filters on all of these um, but during totality in a total eclipse that is the one time you can actually look up to see because the sun is actually blocked you can see the corona and all that cool stuff but everything else you're going to need filters so total eclipses will always be the biggest baddest ones of all uh, annulars are very exciting to a lot of people and it still gets a ton of people pumped up but you need filters for the entire thing and partial you need filters for the entire thing total you need filters up to totality and after if you are along the eclipse path or the path of totality if you are anywhere beyond it it is a partial eclipse and you need filters all the time make sure you really understand what you're doing before going out and doing this because we need to know about filters and how to be safe equipment is also going to vary on the type of eclipse partial and annular eclipses the portion of the sun surface is visible through the entire eclipse so any filter can work it could be a narrow band filter like hydrogen alpha or calcium if you want to get unique or it could be simple white light filters or eclipse glasses for total eclipses 
it's basically a partial eclipse all the way up till you get to totality. And then during totality, when the sun is blocked, you don't need the filters just for that very brief amount of time. Um, there's no filter needed if you're in totality. Again, if you're outside of that path, forget it. That is where a white light filter would be more ideal because the whole point of a total eclipse is totality. You don't need the fancy filters for that one. You can if you want to do a cool, interesting time lapse, but once the sun's covered, it doesn't matter. So that's it for eclipse types. Um, location is probably going to be one of the biggest things, though. And that's, you know, where are you going to view it? Now, here's the path of 2017, and then here's the path of 2024. That's where you need to be in to see totality for 2024. And that's where you had to have been if you were going to see it in 2017. Now, the biggest information, um, the biggest information you're going to need for viewing an eclipse is, of course, the weather. Where's the best weather going to be for the eclipse? Um, that's a huge problem. And for 2017, it was pretty easy because the weather along that eclipse path at that time of year was fairly stable for a lot of the path. We lucked out on that. 2024 being in April and the path that it's going is a lot harder. Um, the weather in the particular region that the path is uh, going the path is the weather isn't that great that time of year for that geographical location your best bet is probably going to be further south kind of pushing down into texas and even into mexico but as you move up into the eastern part of the united states weather gets really iffy in april that time of year um, you'll probably luck out at times but that is something that you really need to pay attention to is what location is probably going to give you the safest bet as far as weather goes because it might be that the day of or the day before the weather is looking like garbage where you're going to be you might have to pick up and go um, so you need to be mobile as well that's a very big deal and account for last minute changes it's a lot like storm chasing um, you need to be aware of what you're going to be doing um, especially if you're in totality because I will tell you from experience totality is the most amazing thing you will ever see I think every single person should experience a total eclipse in their lifetime period it's that awesome it doesn't matter if you're into astronomy or not it's the most amazing thing you'll ever see but you have to be along that path and ideally you want to make sure the weather is going to be good because for most of that path we're only talking about three to four minutes of totality if you have a little cloud that comes by and blocks the sun for five minutes, you just lost it. So you want to make sure you're mobile and you're ready to go if the weather's not looking great that time of year. Uh, plan ahead. You're not going to want to wait till the last minute. Hotels along the path of totality for a total eclipse skyrocket in price. You might have to find a place. You know, Airbnbs are ridiculous. People will crazy overcharge to stay in that place because they know people will pay for it. This is why you're going to look for campsites. Look for places that you know will be available if you can. If you have friends' houses, maybe you have your house. Lucky duck. Um, but don't wait till the last minute to plan your trip and your location and figure out your logistics um, at that point because you might have to ship things to that maybe you're flying uh, whatever like whatever it's going to take you to get to your location you have to plan for flights driving mailing stuff shipping stuff um, but you need to plan ahead and planning a year or more in advance is the best way to do it you want to make sure come the day of the eclipse everything is easy at that point no last minute planning you know what your gear does you know how it works it all comes together come eclipse day there should be no second guessing anything on that day this is like the super bowl you've planned for this whole time this is what we're here to do um the most the biggest thing you should have to do come eclipse day is set up your stuff and sit in the chair and wait that's all you should have to do. All the hard stuff should be done. 
I mentioned this earlier, prices for hotels can be ridiculous. Absolutely mind boggling how much some of this stuff can actually be. So if you can score something ahead of time before, you know, price hikes happen, that's great. Maybe you could work a deal out with a hotel or an Airbnb. If you're gonna show up with some equipment, maybe you could share your equipment and the views through your equipment with them and work a deal out. It's something you could try to do. Um, but location is the most important thing for the eclipses. Now, the total eclipse is obviously the most demanded one, but it still goes for the partial eclipses and the annular eclipses. The annulars do have a path. Um, if you want to know, let me see. October 2023 eclipse path. Let me pull this up because it seems like some of you don't know where the path is for... Um, this one hold on just a sec let me find a nice map um this one works um so the eclipse path for 2023 in october is gonna be right through here going through the southwest um that's where it's gonna be right there so there's the path for 2023 what's this thing what's not moving there we go there's the path for the annular solar eclipse if you want to see the ring of fire in october that's where it's going to be and then you can see as we branch out um, to the west the southwest and into the northeast um, you can see the percentage of the sun blockage you know from there um it's pretty good across most of the U.S. at that point. Like minimum, you're talking about 15% up there in like Maine. So it looked like a little cookie bite got taken out of the sun. But I mean, if you're in the majority of the United States, you're looking at 30 or more percent, especially if you're out west, you're looking at 80% coverage um, for that. But along that path there, you can get that very cool ring of fire. Um, but that type of eclipse is not nearly as in high demand as like a total eclipse because totality is something amazing. Um, but for those of you who don't know, that is the 2023 eclipse um, for next year in October. And then right here is the 2024 eclipse in um, April of, of 2024. All of this will be covered tomorrow at Seoul as well, but you'll get your hands on all the equipment too. Which is our next segment and the biggest segment, equipment. Um, observing the sun is dangerous to do. You need to make sure that you have the proper filtration on whatever you are using to protect your eyes. Welding glass is not an option. It's not a good option. Don't do it. Get yourself some of those Eclipse glasses. I'd show you one, but they're all at Seoul getting ready to go for tomorrow. Um, basic eclipse classes you can get a pack of them for like five bucks right now those things will be hot come october of next year and april of the following year it's gonna be crazy buy some of those glasses just put them away like no big deal you can get free ones tomorrow if you come to seoul we'll give them to you um but you really want to understand the types of filters if you don't know and that is tomorrow what soul is all about understanding the various types of solar filters a lot of this is review i will mention from our previous episode um all eclipses are going to require filters in some extent uh and the type of filter really varies upon the eclipse narrowband filters like h alpha calcium sodium uh i forgot all of them um those are going to be good for when the surface is visible, like a partial or an annular eclipse. Um, white light filters are a fantastic way to do eclipses. They're very affordable. You can get them for a wide variety of equipment from like binoculars all the way up to big telescopes. But you just want to make sure that your filters are firmly mounted and set up for your particular setup. But to break this down really quick, um, there's our partial. So the the surface of the sun is always visible in a partial eclipse. So a white light filter, perfectly fine. Narrow band, if you want to get some interesting detail like prominences, um, all of that is uh, 
viable. Uh, what about an Optolong L Pro? Good question. That's a hard no. Um, you want to, if you're observing the sun, you want to make sure you're actually using a true solar filter. Um, nighttime filters are not going to work. Optolong filters, they are great for astrophotography of the night sky, but they are not designed for the sun at all and should not be used. So um, anything from Optolong, it's, it's not a solar filter. It is, does not handle what we need it to handle. So they are not an option at all. And that includes the L Pro. The L Pro is a light pollution filter, a very good light pollution filter. It's good for shooting in town, you know, galaxies, all that fun stuff, but it is not an option for observing the sun. It would be incredibly dangerous to do something like that. So make sure you're using a true solar filter. You know, they're out there. AstroZap. Uh, I use uh, spectrum telescopes for white light, Herschel wedges from a variety of manufacturers. And of course, you just have a ton of awesome narrowband filters, uh, solar narrowband filters like from Lunt Solar Systems or Daystar. And there's other manufacturers as well that you can get them from. Okay. Uh, so a partial eclipse, the surface of the sun is always visible. So a basic white light filter or narrow band. Narrow band is actually kind of fun for a, a partial eclipse, like your H alpha filters, uh, solar H alpha filters. Perfect. Um, I'm skipped ahead on all this. Sorry. Here, let me bring up all the details of a partial eclipse that we just covered. Um, but yeah, your filters are going to stay on all the time for a partial eclipse because the surface of the sun is always visible. Annulars. Annulars are the same thing because part of the disk of the sun is visible. Um, you know, part of the sun is always visible. There's going to be very little change seen around you. you uh, if you're in the path of an annular eclipse, you will probably feel the temperature change a little bit because less of the sun is visible. Um, but the whole disk is not covered. So there will still be daylight. It might feel a little different, but overall still be daylight. Um, surface details can still be seen. So if you're using like some exotic thing like um, an H alpha, like a Lunt or a Daystar filter or you know anything like that, you can get the prominences and all kinds of cool detail if you're doing narrow band. But you can do it with an annular eclipse because part of the sun's surface is still visible. Um, it can also make it more dynamic if you're doing imaging or something like that. It's a fun way to do it, um, especially if the sun's very active like it should be in 2023. It might be worth doing time lapse or video of an annular eclipse with an H alpha telescope um, because the activity is high. But filters stay on all the time, again, because it's an annular eclipse and part of the sun is always visible. Total eclipses, however, are a completely different game. Uh, I would recommend white light filters all the way through. I wouldn't even mess with narrow band filters for a total eclipse. Um, part of the sun is visible before and after totality. That is when the filters are on. Um, you are going to have a crazy amount of change when you go into totality. The sun will be blacked out. The spot where the moon is covering the sun is the blackest black you've ever seen. Um, major temperature drop, 360 degree sunset like appearance, uh, bright stars and planets will be visible to the naked eye. Um, it's very cool. The birds go to sleep. It just is weird, but it's cool. Um, the sun's disc is fully covered during totality. And at that point, only in totality, filters can be removed to capture the corona but they have to be installed before totality ends. Uh, this is why I like white light filters because you can put a white light filter in front of your optics, do the whole partial portion, and then when you get to total, you can get focused on it, make sure everything's nice and tight and ready to go. And then once you're in totality, your optics are focused and the sun's blocked, you can pull that filter off and go to town snapping pictures away or viewing or whatever you wanna do. Um, but it's easy to remove for totality and reinstall before totality is over. You have to make sure that filter goes back on. 
How long is totality for 2024? I think it's four and a half minutes max. Um, I think it's time and date. Uh, 2024 eclipse. There's a really good website. Uh, yeah. So it's timeanddate.com. Um, their website is awesome because they have an interactive map. Here we go. This map right here is awesome. You can figure out where you're going to be. The big dark red line is totality. Everything outside of it is partial. But you can just go and click on it wherever you're going to be. And it'll tell you all about, you know, maximum eclipse, when it is, how long it is. So about four and a half minutes is the longest period for 2024, somewhere around there. Um, which is pretty good. It's better than 2017 was. So 2017 was quick. Um, but yeah, yeah. Four minutes and 26 seconds, close enough. So four seconds off. Um, but that's totality for you. Um, what I would recommend is always keep your setup simple. Do not overcomplicate it. I am the king of overcomplicating setups. I change things at the last minute, and every single time I do it, it just screws something up. So I'm learning from my own mistakes. I'm telling you, please just keep it simple. I know it's awesome to have all this cool stuff and drag a million things out. You don't have time, um, and it's not worth it. The more complicated, the more you're going to have to work on. It's not worth it, especially when you're talking about a total solar eclipse. You have for 2024, 20, you've got four, four minutes and 26 seconds to make it happen. You don't care when you're in totality at all. You just want to take it in and enjoy it. Try to take some pictures, but be prepared to where you don't have a lot of time. So keep your setup simple. I like to use two scopes on one mount. I piggyback it. I use one for visual so people can watch the annular eclipse kind of the partial phases kind of come into play. And then my second telescope is my photographic telescope. It's got the camera on there. It's focused. I don't have to touch anything. So that way I can view it and shoot it at the same time. Um, and usually I use white light filters only. Um, I love my Coronado 90. It's an old Tucson 90. Um, it's amazing. I love my Daystar filter. Wouldn't use it for total eclipse. It's just, I am there for totality. And that's it. Um, but make sure you've got the filter that you want to use for the eclipse. Uh, use a tracking mount. Do not use a manual mount. Um at all so yeah let's see um you want to make sure that you're only using a tracking mount because you don't want to be dealing with any of that manual tracking during the during the eclipse you just want to line it up set it forget it so something like a star adventure perhaps you know something easy so um Totality is going to be very, very short, so you don't want to mess around with any of it. So like I said, a tracking mount is good. Uh, wake up before dawn, align your EQ mount. Get it polar aligned so it's dialed in and you're ready to go. Um, that's re really make your life so much easier come Eclipse. You can just walk out there, point it at the sun, turn it on, you're good. Just set it and forget it. So. Um, you want to eliminate as much setup as possible beforehand. You don't want to be messing with the least amount of stuff possible um, if you can. Um, I really liked uh, Solar Eclipse Timer. It's a fantastic app, and the creator actually has a very good write-up on the 2024 Eclipse. Um, timing is key to make sure that you get the shots that you want, especially when we're talking about totality and making sure the filter comes off and on in the right spot so you're not going to damage anything um, so solar eclipse timer it's an app um, it's highly worth it it actually is a must in my opinion if you're shooting totality um, just to pay attention but that's how i was able to get my shots you know bailey's beads the diamond ring all those phenomenon that you want to see totality all of that needs to be planned well in advance and you need to be on the time because it, i 
saw people that nuked their massive Canon five and 600 millimeter lenses because the iris was in the way and the sun melted it or damaged their camera sensor because they didn't put the, the filter back on in time. So make sure you're paying attention to the time. Solar Eclipse Timer is the best app out there for it. You have to get it if you're going to be doing a total solar eclipse and you're going to shoot it, especially if it's your first time. It just it has call outs. It's audible. It's just telling you, you know, pull the filter off five seconds, totality, five seconds, whatever it is. It's just telling you and keeping you on time. Big deal when you've only got four minutes and 26 seconds to get it done. Optics. Um, you know, just about any telescope can work for observing the sun as long as you've got filters. So make sure they're filtered in whatever way that you want. But pretty much anything will work. Um, if you're planning to shoot an eclipse, I usually recommend somewhere between 500 and 1,000 millimeters for your focal length. So you've got some image scale. That way you can see it. Refractors tend to be the easiest optical design um, or a super telephoto lens are also good choices. Uh, you can use Newtonians and Cassegrains and all the reflector types, but I feel refractors are the easiest telescope to work with. They're also the, one of the easiest telescopes to adapt filters to. Um, they just take the guesswork out completely. So I highly recommend a refractor, some 500 to 1000 millimeters in focal length or a super telephoto lens. Um, if you're going to be shooting with a crop sensor, usually about 600 millimeters is pretty good, especially if you're doing a total solar eclipse. You don't want to be zoomed in all the way. You need to give some room around the sun's disk so you can get uh, the corona when it comes around. So like a 600 millimeter lens works pretty good. This is 600 millimeters on a crop sensor. Uh, there's the disk of the sun, and then you've got plenty of room for the corona to exist around the disk. Um, you could go longer if you want, especially if it's like an annular or a partial eclipse. Then you can go longer focal length, zoom in more because we're not having to pay attention to the corona at all for an annular or a partial. But for a total, you want wiggle room around the sun. For full frame, it would be about a thousand millimeters at that point. And that gives you pretty much the same field of view. The yellow box there, it's a little bit tighter, but that's a thousand millimeters with a full frame sensor. Um, these would be my recommended focal lengths for a total eclipse. Uh, for annular, you could for annular or partial, you can actually go up further if you want, but you can make it work. But these would be the minimum focal lengths for what I would recommend for shooting the eclipse. When I did 2017, it was a Canon 7D Mark II and then a spree 100 that was 550 millimeters it worked just fine so i can tell you from experience if you have a little refractor that's five six hundred millimeters in focal length you're all set just make sure you've got some camera adapters and a white light filter and you're all good to go so that's it that's all you really need um you don't need to get fancy on it and i would really recommend that you don't it just adds so much extra work um to things um, if you're going to complicate your setup. So please don't overcomplicate it. Do remember that at the end of the day, you are there to watch one of the coolest things that nature will ever do and just enjoy it. Because a lot of people in this hobby, a lot of people get too overwhelmed about the equipment and they, this was with everything. They just get too enamored with equipment and they forget how fun the hobby just is. So when it comes to an eclipse, you have very little time to make it happen. Make sure you're having fun the entire time. Make sure you're just enjoying it. Have your friends and your family come with you. Make it a whole thing. But don't overcomplicate it because you're going to miss it. And it really is an experience um, that you should all see if you haven't seen it. Cameras. Um know the eclipse you're going to be shooting is a big thing is it a uh, partial annular total like what is it or is it a white light filter is it narrow band um because the type of cameras that you're going to be needing for those types of eclipses um are are going to be different maybe it's a color camera maybe it's a monochrome camera you know it all uh it all changes 
depending on the type of filter that you're going to be using. If you're going to be shooting like a monochrome uh, setup, or if you're going to be shooting narrowband, color is not going to make sense. So um, let's see. For a partial eclipse, any camera is going to work. You know, DSLR, mirrorless cameras, or um, a dedicated astronomy camera is nice. Um, but you want to make sure that, you know, ultimately you are probably going to be shooting a monochrome camera if you're going to be using narrowband filters. As narrowband filters, if you're shooting a color sensor, um, narrowband filters are really going to be playing weird with your with your camera. Uh, monochrome cameras are so much easier um, to work with if you're doing narrowband. Um, and if you're going to be doing annular or partial eclipses, you can use the narrowband filters. I would recommend using a monochrome camera if you're going to be doing that. If you're doing white light, you can use a color camera. You can use whatever you want. It just depends on what you've got going on. Um, there you go. There's my bullet point right there. Um, for total eclipses, I find that DSLR and mirrorless cameras are the best. You can make the changes the fastest. You don't have to have any kind of laptop floating around to run your camera. You don't have coolers. They shoot really fast at times because that's a big thing that you're going to want to have is you want to have a camera that can do bracketing. Um, bracketing is where a camera takes several exposures in a row, but they're different exposures. Um, that would be just fine, you know, bracketing, but bracketing really is the key because you want to just hammer out as much exposures as possible. I think I took like five or 600 pictures in 2017 in a very short amount of time. And it really saves you a lot of time. So you don't miss one of those moments and you get the exposure just right. So find a camera that brackets DSLR mirrorless. I would be surprised, honestly, most cameras should be able to have that nowadays. Um, you might have to go into the settings and kind of mess with it and learn um, where that is and how to set it up, but make sure you practice with it. Uh, do you see a disadvantage to using a 300 millimeter lens on a full frame, 50 megapixel um, and cropping? No, that should probably be fine. You know, 50 megapixels is pretty high resolution, so that should be good at that point. Let's see, where are we? Um, and uh, for bracketing, this is totality. Um, uh, so here's an example of bracketing really quick. You know, this is the 7D Mark II um, Canon camera, which I shot 2017 with. This was bracketing. I just set it up. Every expo every shot was a slightly different exposure, and it helped bring the corona out. And that way, I'm not guessing, um, especially because it was my first time. I had no real clue what I was doing. I'm not like Fred Espinek, who's just a pro, um, who literally wrote the book on how to shoot uh, solar eclipses. But bracketing will definitely make your life so much easier. Um, during total eclipse if you're trying to get the corona because you just want to pound that out and figure out what shot's going to be good um, But yeah, that works super well for totality when you're doing that. I think I had some yeah, we duplicated some stuff. Oh That was fast. I'm sorry. So we uh, We plowed through that very quickly. So anyway, that's how to prepare for a solar eclipse um, Next week, uh, we have uh, Dr. Ron Brecher on. Um, he's from astrodoc.ca, amazing astrophotographer, APODs, the whole nine yards. Um, Ron is a world-class imager. Um, we're going to have him on talking about all kinds of imaging stuff next week. Um, I know there's some questions here. I'm going to get to that here. Uh, we kind of blew through this a little faster, which is fine because I'll be doing this talk tomorrow at Seoul and that only has 45 minute time frame, not an hour. So that's just perfect. Um, if you like what you see here on the What's Up webcast, please go ahead and subscribe. Email us at info at skywatcherusa.com. Title it What's Up. Um, and that's pretty much it for preparing for an eclipse. And wow, we can go to questions. Um, there was one back here I missed. In 2026, from the Balearic Islands, the sun is going to be below 2 degrees after totality. Would that still require a filter 
if you can see the surface of the sun, I would probably say you need a filter, period. So that's something that you want to check on there. Um, but you always want to filter if the sun's going to be visible um, or the surface of the sun. Any light could damage your sensor. Uh, we did how long totality is in for 2024 for those four minutes and 26 seconds. Um, do you see any disadvantage of using a 300 millimeter lens and a full frame 50 megapixel camera? No, go ahead and use it. That should be a perfect combination. You can crop it out if you get some good shots. 300 millimeter works really well. It's a nice focal length. Um, you could always rent something too if you want to go longer and not have to worry about that. Um, but yeah, uh, let's see. Do you remember the bracketing offset 1 EV or 2 EV? You know, I don't remember. I When I shot 2017, I don't know if it was 1 or 2. Um, I don't remember. That's a good question. Um, 3? It might be 3 EV. I think it goes up a notch as well. I'm shooting this episode right now live. We're recording with the camera I shot the Eclipse with. So I can't actually check um right now um but yeah it you can mess with the bracketing i think you can do custom bracketing if you want to as well but bracketing is really the uh the key for totality what's the difference between a day star cork filter and a dedicated solar telescope for partial and annular eclipse nothing really uh they're both narrow band filters um the day star cork is a so daystar filters are solid etalons and the way those generally work is they're on the rear of the telescope and they have to work at a very long focal length like f30 or f40 the light has to be fairly parallel to go through an etalon and the way a daystar does that is either by a barlow or a telecentric lens to get the focal length of the native telescope up to f30 or f40 to make sure that light is so parallel to go through the Edelon. Um, so the hard part about that is during an eclipse, like an annular or a partial, you want to see the whole disc. That gets kind of difficult when you're using really long focal lengths like a day star system. Now you can get around that um, by using a shorter focal length telescope, like a day star cork on like a 400 millimeter focal length refractor you can get the whole disc, no problem. Even 550 millimeters or 600, you can do it. It also depends on how big the camera sensor is or how low the eyepiece is. Um, but a Daystar cork or a Daystar filter in general will give you a nice view of the sun. Um, now a dedicated telescope like a Lunt or something like that, it's a little bit easier because you don't have to deal with the long focal lengths. You can just use the native focal length of whatever the dedicated telescope is. So um, I find something like dedicated telescopes, like a Lunt or Coronado or something like that, are a little bit less guesswork, but the Daystar systems are just as effective, um, but they just take a little bit more setup and understanding. And if you're coming to Seoul, you can actually have this conversation with Jen Winters, who understands and owns Daystar, um, to get her actual thought on that process. But um, a Daystar cork or a dedicated telescope would be perfectly fine for annular uh, or partial eclipses. You just want to make sure you have it set up in a way where you can probably see the whole disk. Um, I did not see a package available on Solar Eclipse Timer for 2023 Annual Eclipse as the app. I don't know if Solar Eclipse Timer does annulars. It's not as big of a deal uh, for an annular eclipse um, because you have the filter on the entire time. For total, you're trying to get a couple different things. You want to get like Bailey's beads. You want to get the diamond ring. Um you want to get the corona you want to make sure but you have seconds to do that so the timer for that works really well to make sure you know exactly when you need to be shooting for those phenomenon when you're talking about an annular eclipse the filter stays on the entire time there's not really any particular other than the contacts like first contact second contact third contact fourth contact um, there's not a lot of timing that you need they might have it 
but I, I don't know. Uh, you have to dig into that or give them an email. Um, I use cropping technique with the moon. Okay, that's not a question. Um, I think that's it. I don't see any more questions uh, floating around. If you do, go ahead and email us. I'll be happy to answer them for you. Um, or you could come to Seoul tomorrow and ask us in person. Um, so that pretty much wraps up this week. I really thank you guys for hanging out with us. I know we finished a little early, which actually works out really well because, again, this talk is happening twice tomorrow in a 45-minute window. Um, but I know I can do it. So uh, for those of you who are coming to Seoul tomorrow, thank you so much. I'll see you there. Um, I can't wait for you to just see how much work went into this and how we've got a bunch of stuff going on and all kinds of equipment is going to be literally anything you want to know or see is going to be out there tomorrow. Everything. So um, look forward to seeing you guys there. Um, other than that, please have a good weekend. It's new moon weekend. So go out, do some nice dark skies if you can. Um, and other than that, we will see you guys next week for another What's Up webcast where we'll be talking to Ron Brecher. So thanks very much. Clear skies. Hopefully see some of you tomorrow. And if not, we'll see you next Friday for another episode right here. Take care, everyone. Clear skies. Have a good weekend. Bye.